Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having a, a, another author. James Mate. He's the writer of Quantum Leap Thinking and Owner's Guide to the Mind. And also, we're going to talk about his new upcoming book. He just finished, wrote the last sentence, The Elephant and the Writing, Living an Exceptional Life. But he's going to explain that over to us real quick. If you have any questions of us, please give us a call at 347-324-3460. 347-324-3460. Or you can post a question in the chat room, and I'm going to read it on the air. James means welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Tim, for having me. I guess to begin with, kind of tell us about yourself. Uh, a lot of our audience like to get the personal view from the, the author themselves so they can kind of get to know them better. Well, I'm going to give you a, about a two-minute background here. Oh, that's all right. And I'll, yeah, I'll take you back from quantum leap thinking backwards. I graduated from Cal State University, Northridge, with a master's in theater undergraduate psychology. And so I launched forth in the world with this very curious interest about psychology, but I launched forth as an actor, and I did repertory theater. I came to, for a couple of years, I came to New York to do soap operas and film, and launched into the study of hypnosis, because Ooh. I had seen a hypnotist when I was in one of these theaters. And I thought it was so weird. I'm from Illinois. Back there, you talk about... Uh, you talk about hypnosis, and it's kind of people like freak out, you know, <laughs> ah, the devil, the devil. What? So uh, <laughs> I, I just thought, my goodness, how could this be? How could you influence something? I mean, I didn't know the technical things. I didn't know. I knew about the subconscious and conscious mind, of course. So I fell into a wonderful situation. A man took me under his wing. His name was Harry Aarons, and he was one of the great hypnotist. He wrote 60 books. I ended up studying neurolinguistic programming with uh, Grinder and Bandler. I ended up studying with Milton Erickson and with the, the genius uh, physicist, the kind of uh, Einstein of hypnosis. And as I continue this private practice, I also continued acting. Now, I have, and I'll bring this all together, I have basically four careers, a little army of people that handle them. They run in sync, and I balance it. It all works. So the first... Uh, Five years, uh, well, yeah, maybe three years in hypnosis. I worked with weight, smoking, self confidence, and worked, learned a lot about mind and choices and habits. And then I worked a number of years with athletes, helping them golf, tennis, track, football, helping them increase their performance. And then my specialty became age regression. <clears throat> That's literally taking people back in their past to recover memories and alter memories. I worked with child abuse victims, I worked with the New York Police Department for witness and victims to crimes, helping them recall information, forgiveness issues. So over the years, I broadened my knowledge. And then go back again to 74, I decided I wanted to do a stage show with hypnosis that was a learning experience. So I put this stage show together, which really wasn't, it was a show, but it was also um, entertainment with a message. So I did 1,500 of these shows. And ended up wow. doing it on Broadway uh, six years ago. Ended up doing a Lincoln Center in Manhattan. And I've kind of set that aside. In 1982, a friend of mine talked me into, well, actually 81, talked me into going in business speaking. And I thought, well, you know, let me think about that. That was when I established the Quantum Leap Thinking Organization and started to write the book, Quantum Leap Thinking. And it was, I noticed in life from private practice and the whole creative aspect of life, that people, some people just took off. You know, they just seem to make everything click and work. And I also noticed that when we work and we strive and we work and we strive, sometimes there are these huge leaps, and then nothing happens for a while. And that's when a lot of people give up. But I also noticed that people would hit a plateau. They keep learning, growing, being creative, managing change, and it would be this other huge leap. And the bigger the leaps got in their life, the bigger they launched forth, the longer these plateaus took. 
So that was the basis I was interested in quantum physics. And so I wrote this book. It's a very easy book to, I mean, you don't zip through it, but it's a user-friendly book that I went through these stages. So so I'll, I'll get to the book in a second. But then um, I started doing corporate speaking, and I still do, reinventing constantly. And the first kind of pilot program was Quantum Leap Thinking, and that was on creativity. And now the new one, we literally reinvented everything that was launched about a month ago in uh, the corporate field, the organizational field, for sales, marketing, and all other things. One is called Imagine That. And that's about, no one speaks on this, about the power mm-hmm. of the imagination as it affects our growth, our innovation, our creativity, managing change, breaking fear. And the second one is called true leadership, which is the five core principles of a leader. Because, And I, the reason I came up with this is, is leadership is confusing. And I wanted to come up with five core principles that were morally neutral, that were true of all leaders throughout history, good leaders, I mean, morally good leaders, morally bad leaders, the greatest leaders of all time have these five core principles, which we can talk about later. So as we speak right now, at this very moment, these new programs have been launched in the corporate field. I have just finished the new book called The Elephant and the Rider, Living an Exceptional Life. The elephant is the subconscious, the rider is the conscious. And I've got a movie coming out uh, soon, soon, uh, and wow. that, that's where my life is right now. Wow, what a story. <laughs> We're going to back up for a second about hypnosis itself. Within your practice of hypnosis, can you, I can understand you kind of coach a person to back into memory, to recall the things of what happened in a particular incident or happened in the past, but for self-help type therapies, for example, of hep- helping a person to be more confident, helping a person for weight loss, helping a person to get more motivation, or helping that person who's really shy to kind of take a kind of a, a quantum leap forward out of the way that they think today. Uh, in your experience in, the, uh, in those type of areas, uh, how can that really help a person? And how can you bring a person from an active stage where they are right now, a conscious stage, and hypnotize them to go beyond that and to go into this other realm, if that's making sense to you. Well, it does. And I, by the way, okay. so as we speak right now, <clears throat> I don't advertise myself as a hypnotist at all. Mm-hmm. It scares people. But I can answer that <laughs> question by saying, uh, let's forget about weight for a second. Weight has too many issues attached to it. But okay. I use in my private coaching, which I'll be doing today in a couple hours, as well as that's what the new book is about, is, is the rider and the elephant. And I think in order to talk about hypnosis, I have to talk about the conscious and the subconscious mind. The subconscious okay. mind, when people hear that, I think they kind of spaced out. They just, it's kind of this ephemeral term. Well, I, this, the last two years, actually more than two years, has been this explosion of information from the study of brain science. So there's no, what I'm about to say is not speculation. It's all based on what brain science shows. And the subconscious is about 90% of our lives. We do mm-hmm. not control it. It controls us. The rider or the conscious mind is 10%. So anyone who thinks they can control themselves, well, they better hang up the phone or hang up the radio. <laughs> what are they going to do? Because if they have control issues, they're not going to like what I'm about to say. We do not control ourselves, but we can influence ourselves. And influence is what I go after. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you look at the subconscious, it doesn't think like, let's look at, actually, let's look at the conscious first. What's the conscious mind? It's the voice in our head. And if people don't know what that voice is, it's the one that's going, what voice is he talking about? It's called our self-talk, our mind chatter, which has a, a, a huge impact on our belief system, our subconscious. It is also the one part of our mind or our brain that can vision. In other words, have visualization. Subconscious can't visualize at all. In fact, the subconscious does not think. It's our primitive fight or flight. It, it makes decisions like a run or, or, or go towards something or like or dislike. It's, but the subconscious is also the center of our emotion. So that's important to remember for what I'm about to say about what to answer your question. Uh, okay. Center, center of our emotions, it doesn't think. 
And the big thing is this. It cannot tell the difference between a real or an imagined experience. Let me give you an example. All my programs, I start off with a visual. So you, even your listeners can visualize this. I take a lemon and I say, I'm go- I hold it up and I say, I'm going to count to three and take a bite out of this lemon. And what mm-hmm. I want you to do is to imagine biting the lemon with me. And I say, in order to do that, you have to recall, and that's an important thing to remember for how to increase self-confidence. So you have to recall what makes a lemon a lemon. You have to recall that it's yellow. You have to recall that it has texture-wise, kinesthetically, it's a little bumpy. It has a tart smell. And then I cut it in half, and I hold one of the halves up, and it has a lot of juice. I dribble the juice and make a little show out of this. So at the count of three, get ready, and I take a bite. One, two, three. I squish it in my mouth. Now, the largest group I've ever spoken to is 10,000. The smallest is 10. If you had to just take a guess, there's no right or wrong here. What percentage of the audience do you think has some kind of a reaction? Because I asked the question, raise your hand if you had any kind of reaction when I bit that lemon and you imagined biting it. What percentage? 60. Now, up to 95, and it's always the same. Think about this for a second. That means that I come out, ask a group to imagine something. That's the buy-in at the beginning of my talk. Mm -hmm. All these hands go up, and I say, look around you. You just created a miracle. The miracle is that you created something out of nothing. You created a biochemical, physiological, neurological change in your body and your mind less than a tenth of a second by your imagination. So what would be the difference if you imagine looking at your future failing or succeeding or the stock market goes down and you get depressed or the stock market goes up and you get happy or you visualize in the future anything or you go to the past and you think of a past memory? And you get depressed or you get happy. The reality is nothing's happened. But there has been something that's happened. What's happened is you've changed your brain chemistry and you've influenced your subconscious mind. That part that doesn't think, that part is the center of our emotion. It can't tell the difference between a real or imagined experience. Follow? So, I follow. Yeah, good. So that, that means that our ability to visualize has a profound impact on our future. So if you go in to say you've got to stand up before and deliver something to your stockholders or a speech or you got to stand up as a manager, as a leader, and you say, oh, my, oh, I'm going to fail. Oh, 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 you go through all this angst. Well, you start to create stress just like any all stress, all worry is such a waste. But that doesn't mean that you can just stop it with a positive thought. That's kind of silly. So there are tools that I teach people to recognize when they're thinking negatively, which is called reframe it. So you reframe it to a positive, and that starts to influence. Or you go back in your past. For example, let me give you a little. I work mostly with my private coaching is with adults or CEOs or people in relationship and so forth. But this is the perfect story about how this works. I One of the corporate CEOs that I worked with, it, our session was very successful. He said, would you work with my son? I said, well, I really don't work with young people. How old is your son? He said, 13. I said, well, you know, I don't know that I have the rapport with young people. Maybe. I said, what's his issue? He said, well, he loves baseball. He loves baseball. But one of the what happened was his first game that he went to play, he was standing at the plate. The pitcher threw a ball and hit him in the face. Oh. So every time he goes up to the plate, what he does is he flinches. And he can't help it. His positive thinking doesn't work. So I said, you know what? I can do this. I can help him. So he comes in in with me, and we do some fun stuff on the imagination, and he gets it. And I have him go back, and I have him take like a snapshot of that terrible scenario, you know, going up to the plate. I have him reframe it. How you reframe things, and maybe you can kind of visualize this with me. Can you think of something from your past, Tim, that is, and you don't even have to tell me what it is. That is a negative. Something that happened somewhere. You maybe someone passed away, or you were rejected, or you failed. And again, I don't. Everybody's had those issues. I don't want to know what it is. I just want to know if you can. Yeah. I can. Okay. Good. Can you get a picture of it? Absolutely. Kind of in your mind. Okay. If you just and you're on radio, so you can do this. If you close your eyes and you get a picture of that, is it in color or black and white? In color. Okay. Is it close to you or is it far away? Hmm. You know, it's two-dimensional because I see it far away and also see it close. Okay. Now, if you had to just 
do this quickly, and we're doing this over radio. So if you had to uh, give it a scale from 1 to 10, 10 is a t- feeling a terrible experience about that. I would say or zero is you feel no emotion whatsoever. What would you give it? Probably very little emotion uh, since it's so long ago. Okay, it's not powerful yeah. enough. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah, no, it really isn't. But let me I guess. I'll, I'll give you one for me. I, I'll make this up in my head. I okay. went to kindergarten, and I was a nice guy, and I never got in a fight. And I walk, I walk on the playground, and all I want to do is be loved and make friends with people. And the guy punched me in the mouth, right? Mm-hmm. I made a decision at that age not to trust men. I just made that decision. I don't know how. I mean, it's taken a lifetime to get male friends. And so I, if I close my eyes and I do that, I can get – it's in color. It's close to me. It's a horrible experience. I might give it an eight. But if I change that from a color picture in my mind with my eyes closed to a black and white, I can instantly drop it to a five. It's close. So if I push that black and white away and I imagine it like the size of a television screen, just in my soul, I can feel this happening. It's now dropped to a three. I make mm-hmm. it smaller like an eight by 10 picture. It becomes a two. I make it smaller and smaller until it disappears. Now, that's called reframing. And it never fails under any conditions when somebody looks at something they're afraid of. And then what you do is you go back in your path and you find something that was absolutely fabulous, like a, that you won something. Like I won, let's say, I won the, the Variety Artist Award for my show. That was one of the greatest experiences of my life. So I go back and I pull that emotion and I start, then I, so that's a very positive. And then I visualize in the future what I want to do that scared me. And I plug that emotion in. And that's called reframing. So that's a mm-hmm. visualization technique, but it's also, if you want to call it a self-hypnosis technique. All visualizations are a form of self-hypnosis. So the answer is you can increase your self-confidence. You can take yourself to, to a whole new level, but you can do it pretty fast. People can go to my website. i got free articles on there because I have a, a, a syndicated column, and I always take the article from that once-a-month thing and put it on my website, and it's free, and people can go poke around. A lot of this information is on there as well as my book. And, in fact, one of my favorite chapters in the book, one of the points is visualization. And one of the other points is I'm very big on teaching people how to recognize and overcome fear. Mm -hmm. And this is a big deal. See, fear is the greatest destroyer of creativity and forward movement. But most people never think about fear. All they do is feel it and then react to it because that's part of how the mind's made up. But if you start to investigate how fear works, you start to see there are different kinds of fear. I'm very, I have fear before I go in front of an audience. I have fear before I perform. I have fear before I skydive. I have fear before I race a car, but it's really fun. <laughs> it, I call it delicious fear. And then you have the primitive fear, fight or flight. And that's the kind of fear where people have a knee-jerk reaction to something and they either attack or run away. Mm-hmm. But the kind of fear that stops everyone from executives to managers to students I call illusory fear. And illusory fear is when we read what isn't real as real. Let me give you an example. Everyone has the fear of rejection. And that doesn't mean that they do something silly or self-defeating. But if the fear is so big, it becomes illusory. Here's what happens. If Let me ask you a question. If um, what is when you say, when I say the fear of rejection, what is underneath that? What is the real fear of? I'm not going to press you too hard on this. It's it's, it's a fear hmm. of isolation, right? Okay. Of being alone. Okay. Okay. So we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of being alone. I mean, why? Well, under all conditions. Now, let's suppose that fear um, manipulated me, or I call it running. In other words, it controls you. You don't control the fear. What? If the fear is being alone, what might I do that would be really stupid to make that true? Well, one thing I would do is I might become jealous. All right. If I become jealous of someone, that if jealousy is one of the most unattractive things in the world. What happens to the other person? Or I might become possessive. What happens to the what does the other person do? Or I might become a bully. Right? Same thing. Bullies all fear based stuff. Mm-hmm. What would the other person do? If if I tried to bully you, what would you do? If we were, you know, together? Well, I guess I'll really? run. 
Okay, exactly. <laughs> you would leave and I would end up alone. Or if you were aggressive, you might take a poke at me and then, and then we'd still be isolated. So that, so that, see, it's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Or the other side of the coin is I might isolate because I'm afraid of being rejected. I might not participate. I might not be social. I might not network. I might isolate myself so I can't be hurt. Well, I've created my own worst nightmare, but I don't know it. I think I'm protecting and I've isolated mm-hmm. myself. So the fear has controlled me. The same holds true with failure. If you're afraid of failure, what don't you take? Mm-hmm. Risk. The fear. Right? You don't you take Absolutely. Right? So you can't learn. And I always say to feel, well, you know, what, if I have advice for people, there's two things. Make friends with failure. Make friends with failure. You know, in other words, go out and do stuff, fail and learn, feel bad, but let it go quickly. So quantum leap thinking has a number of points in it. Well, and the points, each point has, uh, it, 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 quantum leap thinking has a base and the base of quantum leap thinking is creativity, managing change and continuous learning. And on mm-hmm. top of that base is 14 points. And each of these points, I think, lead us to what I call a quantum leap. And the points are, they're easy, they're not easy, they're simple, but they're not easy to master. And so, I, you know, each of these are a subject. Each of these we could talk about. We've talked about two already. One is turning fear into power. One is being able to create a support group around you. There, so there's a lot of different areas that, that people can, people can learn about how their mind, and I call it managing the mind. When you learn to manage fear, you learn about visualization, which is you want to call a mild form of self-hypnosis. That's fine. You learn about mm-hmm. value. For example, one of the points is passion. So what does that mean? Well, it's also a point of leadership. What it means is doing that which turns you on. Because so many people go out in the world, they do things because their parents wanted them to do them, or society says you've got to do them, and they end up, my my father worked at a job he hated for 35 years, his entire career, he hated going to work. Um, mm-hmm. So you look internally. And you start to see what are your values. There's only about 50 values. And my, my, my top three values are love. And that means, well, we talked about that. Love is kind of the opposite of fear. And I don't mean that in mm-hmm. a soft, cuddly way. I just mean that's how I try to look at life. Fun and integrity. Those are my top three values. And mm-hmm. then I go down the list. Well, I certainly want to be congruent with those values in what I do in life. So if I'm not congruent, meaning that I don't walk my talk, I am not going to be satisfied. And then I have to look at what are my life priorities. Well, I love having fun. I love helping people. I love performing. I love learning. Now, learning is about the best thing in the world. I get paid to learn. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> pressing my pressing myself up against a wall. I mean, there's people... People should be out reading magazines. That's how creativity works. They should be out reading the latest books. There's two books out now that I just looked this morning because I hadn't read the Sunday Times bestseller list, and they're both on the list. I can't believe it. One is called The Power of Habit, and it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And how to, it, it's just from a scientific approach, but it tells you how to break negative habits. The other one is called Imagine, and it's about the science of creativity. So there's so much information with the web and with uh People like me who are out there that want to help people learn how to manage their mind, take these leaps, and move forward. Hmm. I do go. I'm passionate about what I do. So yeah, no, that's all right. You know, offer, ask me anything you want because I just go. <laughs> wow, this book itself, the owner's guide to uh, quantum leap thinking. I mean, with all the, I can see how you wrote the book and uh, all your experiences coming into one one particular thought. Talking about your, your new book you just finished, what you, you have you taken part of this book and write a sequel to the new book, or is it a con- complete different thought altogether? I anyway? would say that certainly there are overlaps, but not much. With Quantum Leap Thinking, Owner's Guide to the Mind, it's just that. I talk about, you know, what I've kind of touched on, the 14 points, and then I'll move into the next thing, are pay attention, turn fear into power, hold a vision. Enlarge your goals, be flexible, have commitment, empower, communicate with integrity, create partnership, have fun, take risks, trust, and love. See, all these points are from quantum leap thinking there, but some of these create support. The elephant in the rider 
what tur- what started me on this is I wanted to really look in a scientific way, but a fun way, at the subconscious and conscious mind. So the first mm-hmm. part of this book, I call it I, The Elephant and the Rider Are Born. So the first part is about the creation of the mind and how the idea for The Elephant and the Rider came about. Because if you go back in the self-help field, people say, well, your subconscious is like a computer and you program the computer. And, well, that's not exactly right, because it is and it isn't. So the first part of the book is explaining about that. It's very interactive. The elephant and the right is very interactive. And then it goes into perceptions and how our perceptions and our perceptual lens is colored and what we can do to get clear on what we want. It goes into, and I should start at the, Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said one of his points is start at the beginning with the end in mind, which he means is if you're going to create a goal, create it vividly in your mind and work backwards of how you're going to get there. So the last three chapters of my book came from a learning experience in my private coaching. And I discovered it, and I've had people come to me to improve their golf game, their tennis game. I've had people whose marriages are falling apart, who have trouble with their children, who want to start a new business, who can't manage a team. And what I've discovered with all my private clients is they need to let go of something. And letting go is one of the greatest challenges of mind because the elephant or the subconscious wants to hang on to stuff like resentment and scenarios about revenge. I call them revenge thinking. In other words, I'm going to get even with that person, even if somebody's been dead, you know, it's like my mother screwed me up and I've never let that go or somebody hurt me when I was young and I've never let that go. All that stuff stops us from living a life of quality or what I call an exceptional life. So the last three chapters are on letting go, forgiveness, the ultimate let go, and then two tools for forgiveness. And when I say forgiveness, that's not a touchy feeling thing because I base it all in case studies about when we hang on to anger or revenge thinking or that kind of resentment thinking. It does so many destructive things and it, it lowers our immune system. It stops mm-hmm. creativity. It hurts relationships because what we do is we, we often carry what I'll call a dead past and then, and project it on the future. It's like saying, well, it never worked before, so I'm not even going to try anymore. Or I've never had a relationship that really worked or I can't trust a man or I can't trust a woman. And we project that in the future and then we create it to be true because we act the same as we did in the past. And so healing the past or if that's too soft for people, letting go of the past is extremely important to living a life in the future that is full of creativity and possibility. And all this takes work. A buddy of mine once said to me years ago, he said, you know, all this stuff takes a lot of work. And I said, yes, it does. You don't get something for nothing. My wife says living with me is like living with her head in a Cuisinart. You know, <laughs> she, I never <laughs> stop. I never stop this. I get, I'm not going to stop this when I get off our conversation. You know, this, this is my life. This is what I love to do is think about thinking. So the new book really picks up where this book lets off. And both stand on their own. I mean, Quantum Leap Thinking and Owner's Guide to the Mind has gotten incredible play. It's a, I, you know, I'm not promoting this book to make money. In case your listeners wonder if, if, if someone makes money off a book, the answer is no. But it has been the greatest calling card of my life. It has opened up doors for me. It is, it, you know, I just think that the writing a book, and it's hard. I have dyslexia and I have ADD. Right. So I, and I didn't, I wrote this myself. I didn't hire anybody to do it. That's why it took 14 years and I've learned pers- what persistence is. I mean, another lesson that I say to people is look, have passion about what you want to do. That means if you're going to do something in life, try to make it about two things. Try to make it about something you love mm-hmm. and something that will help people. Now, I, again, I'm, I just launched a new program two and a half years ago. I was shooting a movie in Scotland as an actor. And I came, it was a thriller, and I came home, and I got depressed. And I found out three days later I had an aneurysm, and and I had two weeks to live, an aortic aneurysm. And within two weeks, I had my heart taken out of my body and repaired and put back in. I mean, that's pretty dramatic. I I went into that experience saying, you know what? I am not going to be defeated by this. It was scary. I was terrified. But I was going to come out with something to teach someone. And so I got a new program called Patient Pre-Op Post-Op Healing Therapy that mm-hmm. helps people prepare for major surgery, helps them heal faster. It's 
It's all based in brain science, and we just put it, we're putting it up at Yale New Haven Hospital. So there's a, so that's my passion is to, what turns me on? What can I do to learn? What can I do to have fun? And then persist. Hey, I'd rather go to a movie than write. You know, in fact, often I'd rather do anything than write, but I have to look at my vision of what I want in my life. So, and that's the other thing about the subconscious. The subconscious elephant does not want to do long-term sacrifices. It wants what it wants now. It wants that piece of chocolate. It wants to go goof around. The beauty of our conscious mind, or what I call the rider, is that's the visionary, that's the critical one, and that's the one that can give us control. And mm-hmm. that, you know, it, because everyone wants to just let things slide, but if you want something, you got to hammer away on it all the time. Every day, seven days a week, or six days a week, figure out what you want, be persistent about it. Do your best to help other people. Get a support group around you. That's one quality I talk about in both my books is how do you create a people, positive people around you? Because when I first met my wife 25 years ago, she pulled me in her office and she said, I'm going to show you something. Up on her wall, she said, I will not be around people that vex the spirit. And I got, mm-hmm. I won't be around, I personally, and we won't personally be around people who are negative, who drain us of energy who are not life enhancers, because you look back, listen, who do people that do drugs hang out with? And I'm not, you know, I went through my phase, <laughs> but they hang around with people who do drugs. I, you want to hang around with people that elevate you. You want to hang around with people that are smarter than you. Like our, mm-hmm. a lot of our people are amaze me. One of my, one of my pals that, that have developed over the years is the actor Anthony Hopkins. He's a genius. I get around him and I feel stupid. He writes symphonies. He paints pictures. He won an Academy Award. His brain works like lightning. He inspires me to go learn. So, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Wow. Uh, two things real quick. Uh, you talked about the end of your book about letting go. Kind of tell about our audience how to let things go and how to forgive. Yes, I will. Let's look. first of all, you've got to know. You've got to know that hanging on to something. You gotta ask, you gotta ask yourself this question. What's the payoff? What do I get out of hanging on to something? Right? Mm-hmm. Resentments or people that have uh, been bad to me. Because you have to know if you hang on to your grievance scenarios, here's what you're really doing. It's taking a poison pill and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> That's wow. really what it is. Because, mm-hmm. and, and once you switch that little thing about in your mind, you don't Forgiveness is not forgetting. See, people get kind of squirrely about forgiveness. So you don't have to forgive. You don't have to condone bad behavior. Forgiveness means that you let go in your heart of hearts. Now, there's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something I don't usually talk about on the air because it's kind of a technique that I use. But one of my, when somebody comes to me and I discover after, say, an hour and a half of working with them, that they're hanging on to resentment about their new neighbor. You know, it could be their mom or dad who's been passed away for 40 years. Oh, I was mm-hmm. terrible, terrible as a child. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I have them write a letter to the offending person, mm-hmm. and they write it until there's nothing else left to write. And they don't blame. In other words, blame is, you did this to me. Well, actually, that's not true. It's what you did made me feel less than I could feel. It made me feel like I had no self-confidence. It hurt my feelings. That's the way you write this letter. It made me feel like garbage. It made me, it's, it, it's taken away my self-confidence. So you write this letter to this person. Say everything that you ever wanted to say. You let it sit for 48 hours. You read the letter and you burn it or you destroy it. And I promise it will be as if part of this weight is lifted from your soul. That's one way. But first, in the letting go department, you have to know what you need to let go of. It's like, we don't like to let go. That's, I think, the bottom line. We like to hang on to stuff. It's like going in your closet and seeing stuff you haven't worn for five years. And you go to get rid of it, you go, well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe someday I'm going to use it. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I totally it's like understand. going out in was... your garage and going, oh, you know, I haven't touched this stuff for 10 years, but I might need it someday. As the more you hold on to in life, the less space you have to grow. And that means in a phys- physical sense. Um, mm-hmm. And then it means in an emotional sense. So when you forgive and you let go, and by the way, forgiveness is a moment-to-moment thing. It's, for, you know, 
somebody who cuts me off in Connecticut, it's illegal talking a cell phone. I swear I get hit almost three times a day. And do you think I don't get angry? I want to yank, I want to jump out of that car, yank that person out and make them eat their cell phone. So, you know, I have a temper, but I will tell you when I realize I look at my stomach and it's upset and my body's in a knot, I take a breath. It's always, that's one of the techniques I teach is deep breathe, deep breathe about two or three breaths because that's all fear stuff. You want to control the fear and you need to deep breathe. You need to get oxygen in the brain. And then I kind of look, you know, go to the person. I go, you know what? They may have an accident. They may do this. They may be under stress. It may be an emergency. I just forget that. I let it go. Doesn't mean I forget. It means I forget. Now, that's a teeny thing. But it happens. Somebody cuts in front of the line somewhere. And you, go, rah, rah, rah. And you just, you know, life's too short. Listen, let it be. Let it go. Mm-hmm. That's on the small stuff. So my advice to people is start forgiving the small things first. And then you start to build up the forgiveness muscle <laughs> because forgiveness is a challenge. It's not easy. So that, that's, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, it did. Anything else you would like to kind of leave us with, number one, and if you have a chance to go ahead and read it, something out of your book that stands out to you that you feel passionately about, that you want to kind of convey to the audience, I would say just go for it, uh, in either one of the books. Oh, boy. Well... I think if I were to leave anyone with a thought, I said it earlier, is make friends with rejection and make friends with failure. In other words, go mm-hmm. out, do stuff, fail, learn, grow, and also study. And then look at what your life is. Take a little time to look at what maybe the vision of your future for yourself is. That's different than a goal. A goal we do as a beginning, a middle, and an end. But a vision... Mm-hmm is something that in my private practice I always get people to look at. It's about what does your whole life look like right now, right this minute. And a vision is about greatness. It has different parts to it. It's about others. So I Mm -hmm. look in my future and I think, how can I be of service to others? A vision is bigger than ourselves. And I'm not talking about religion. I think we get stuck with that word. And I think religion often separates us more than it brings us together. But I am talking in an odd way about spirituality. And that is that we're all connected. And, you know, it's like if I throw a piece of garbage out the window when I drive, I, I, you know, somebody's got to pick that garbage up. And it's kind of like use that as a metaphor for life. So mm-hmm. it's about it, what a vision about the future is about something larger than ourselves. And there's a wonderful book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and he, he, was, he came from the concentration camps, and he really set out to survive by helping other people. And it has to, a vision has to be authentic. Be true to yourself. The world is not easy because it puts pressure on us. It's like young people who go and, you know, they have their worlds in the social network, and they end up getting hurt, and some people even taking their life. What you give, you're, you're giving your power away to other people. Be, look within yourself. Be authentic within you. Know that you, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And make your vision extraordinary. Make, reach for the stars and let it come from your heart. Let it come from your emotions and let it come from your feelings. And then the last part is let it be value based. What are your top values? And again, values are anything. Values could be money, fun, honesty, love, integrity. And there are, probably the last thought would be this. I believe there are only two emotions in life, period. It's what I base all mm-hmm. my teachings on, love and fear. And any emotion that you could throw at me is going to go in one of those two categories. Like guilt is all fear-based. So when one exists, the other can exist. And when you learn to let go of fear, you learn to recognize it, you learn to study fear, because when you, the more you study, the more focus you put on learning about your fear, the more power you take away from it. And then it's easier to let go of. Wow. Well, well said, James. I really appreciate it. And again, kind of tell us, uh, how can we get your books? Is it available through Amazon and other places? or It is available on our site. The download, by the way, I just matched all the, you know, the downloads. You read, probably read about this recently, the last two or three days. The downloads are down to nine ninety nine, and there's all sorts of fuss about it. So we just lowered our download on our site. But people go to my site www.jamesmapes, M-A-P-E-S, jamesmapes.com. There's all sorts of stuff. There's articles. They can poke around. They can see what we're doing. They can sign up for my mm-hmm. monthly newsletter. I send out an article about some subject every month that will help people. 
And Great. there's no charge for it. So they just can get it. Okay. And uh, give us a website again. www.jamesmapes, one word, dot com. James Mapes, M-A-P-E-S, J-M-E-S, M-A-P-E-S. Great. Well, James, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I mean, it's been really enlightening, a wealth of information. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tim, so much for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. And send me the link, and I will put this on the air. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Will do. Bye thank bye. you. Take care. Bye. Again, it's been another production of The Core Business Show with Tim J.K. Thank you for listening. And if you would like to get a copy of this episode, it's free. Just go to iTunes and download it there. Also, you can get it off of Blog Talk Radio Network and also on our blog Apple Capital Group. Uh, free, uh, free to write any comments uh, in iTunes or on the Blog Talk Radio about the show. Thank you for listening again. Again, Tim J.K., Core Business Show. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.